just to kick this off, I'm going to be a bit controversial here and challenge some things. So you talk about nature, money, work, care, food, energy and lives being precious things that you say are cheapened by capitalism. But I see people every day who don't have enough money to buy food. Surely cheap is good so we can afford to eat better and to live and to experience more in our lives, to have more food, more travel, more gadgets. What's wrong with this? <laughs> um, well, first of all, th thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Rosemary. And thank uh, all y'all uh, in the audience. I, I am uh, in, the, in the stolen lands of Texas here uh, in uh, Comanche and Tonkawa territory. Um, and yeah, you're, you're, you're asking the right question, Kathy. And clearly the audience uh, thinks that there's, that, that there's something perhaps just a little uh, tendentious about the way that you're asking it. Because look, I, I work with low-income communities uh, in, in the United States and around the world. And of course, there is a dignified emergency among the poor right now, uh, where there isn't enough money to be able to afford things like food and medicine and rent. And sometimes one of those things has to go. Uh, and sometimes two and sometimes all three. Now, the, uh, in, into that context, uh, a multinational will come charging in and say, look, we've got the cheapest possible food. How amazing is that? Uh, wh wh why would you take this precious lifeline away from the poor? The problem is that uh, this cheap food is achieved uh, by you know, the destruction of the planet. Uh, it's also the case that here in the United States, seven out of the 10 worst paying jobs are in the food system. So if you want to know why someone is unable to afford to eat, one of the reasons is they're employed by the food business. Uh, and uh, th that's the only way in which cheap food gets to be cheap is because workers are exploited all the way along the food chain. Uh, and you know, th the deeper thing here, Kathy, is this. Uh, food cannot solve hunger. Food can't solve hunger because hunger isn't a problem of the absence of food. We've got more than enough food in the world to feed everyone. Uh, the problem of hunger is a problem of poverty. And the food system as it's set up at the moment is engineered to manufacture poverty. Uh, and so that's what's bad about cheap food is that because uh, we've set up a system where uh, folk are scrambling to be able to make ends meet, cheap food fills a gap. But the reason that gap exists is because the food system has exploited them in the first place. One of the interesting things about the pandemic uh, has been the, 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 the possibility of thinking rather different, differently about what governments can do to make sure that everyone's okay. Um, so we had a, a very rare example of uh, the government of the United States treating food as a human right. Uh, now, obviously not the federal government, not under Donald Trump, uh, but uh, in uh, New York, for example, uh, food was available for free to anyone who wanted it from the school system. Now, uh, that food wasn't terrific. It was ultra processed and it was largely bad for you. Uh, but it opened the possibility for people to think, well, all right, look, it's, this is our tax dollar money anyway. Um, instead of giving it to the Pepsi-Cola company or Frito-Lay or whoever it is, why don't we spend it on our local farmers? I mean, you know, if our organic farmers need support to be able to grow sustainably and you know, to, to really uh, take care of the soil and the water in ways that we want them to, then we should probably pay a premium. And if it's possible to think that way uh, in the United States, it's possible to think that way anyway. I mean, I, I've seen, for example, in Brazil, the school systems uh, have been set up to pay a 30% premium for locally produced food uh, and a premium on top of that if it's organic and agroecological. And that means that kids develop a taste for these complex, rich, earthy, you know, difficult vegetables and fruits uh, early on and they come to appreciate their farmers. They come to appreciate that they can, you know, food doesn't come out of a plastic bag uh, or, you know, that th th carrots don't grow on trees, um, which is a sort of myth that uh, alas, too many children in America believe, uh, but that, you know, in fact, you can make a connection with the food system by recognizing that, to some extent, we subsidize the food system anyway, and we have to just get uh, more conscious about the way that we're subsidizing the bad uh, and shift that to subsidizing the good. So let's, let's come back to food for a little bit. In, in what the real cost of food, I thought it'd be really good to look at the real cost of food and as you say, it's not cheap. 
and there are hidden ecological and social costs. Um, and, and you talked earlier about the impact of um, COVID and that that may be one of the triggers to actually improve this. And I guess the other triggers we um, all know about are envi the environmental triggers with the, um, the greenhouse gases in the world, uh, of which I gather about a quarter are made from um, in food production, from insecticide production. So I've been reading a little bit about the, the real cost of food. And if we were to change to a, a user pays for the fully for the real cost of food, we're looking at around 150% increase in food in cost for animal product, about 100, close to 100% for dairy products, and about 25% on plant-based products. How are we going to get there? And what's the impact of that on the poorer people in society? How are we going to make that change without so negatively impacting the lives of people who spend a large proportion of their income on food? What are your thoughts? Oh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I, I, I don't think that it makes sense at all to slap on the full cost of, uh, you know, the ecological and social harms uh, generated by this food system and demand that people pay uh, when, as you say, that, that there's, for, for the, the world's poorest people, this is a struggle. Uh, and the world's poorest people are often employed in agriculture. So, you know, uh, I, I, and I, I just, just to give some, some concrete numbers here, there was a report by uh, those bomb throwing anarchists, KPMG, uh, that looked at um, the, you know, the, 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 the sort of impact of the, the you know, range of uh, 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 sectors on, and the, the environmental footprint of different sectors. Uh, and what they found was that in every sector, yes, you generate some impact, but usually the revenue from that sector, you know, the, just the, the, the sort of the, the turnover in a sector was usually greater than the damage that, that the sector caused. And that was true for everywhere except food. Uh, and in food, for every dollar that you, the, 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 you know, the industry generates in revenue, not in profit, which is smaller, but revenue, the big number, uh, the, you know, for every dollar of revenue, uh, they cause $2.24 of harm. Uh, so there is no way of having a sustainable food system with the kinds of corporations that we have at the moment, with the kind of practices we have at the moment. Just, you know, there's no such thing as a sustainable food industry that looks the way that you recognize it right now. Uh, but in order to move away from that, um, you can't just, you know, have a, a, a pick a price and then slap it on and hope that some, somehow the market corrects. Because as the market corrects, people will, more people will starve than are already starving. So what we need is distribution from rich to poor. Um, and in fact, we should start with that and then move to uh, start you know, increase uh, food prices so that, that um, you know, they, they represent a, a fairer share of the damage that humans are doing. But there's another part to this, uh, and we should be honest about it, and that's about meat, uh, meat consumption. Um, there is no way for the entire planet to eat the, the amount of meat that, say, the average American consumes. It's just not possible for everyone to do as we do in the United States. Uh, and there is a diet that shifts us away. Uh, th th there was a, a very good report called the Eat Lancet Report that uh, observed that it is possible for us to move towards diets that are healthier for us and healthier for the planet and m are possible for everyone to eat. Uh, but that's a diet that does have uh, less animal, uh, you know, that has l l less uh, consumption of animals in it. Um, and I think that that's, that's something that people are just going to have to get over. And meanwhile, we've got food security increase. You know, in Australia, with our droughts and fires and everything that's happening and rainfall becoming less reliable, more crops failing um, and scarce water resources. And, and yet, so we've got that happening on one hand and we've got um, several different bodies saying that to feed the world in 2050, we need to increase global food production by 70%. So yeah, we, uh, I mean, we can't do all of this. No, you can't. Uh, I mean, and it, it's, I mean, it, it baffles me that uh, Australia should double down on, you know, the export of cattle as being the way that Australia is going to feed the world, uh, when in fact there's so much embodied water in that cattle and you're running out of it and you still want to sell it uh, and not really put a, a decent price on that anyway. Uh, th that strikes me as madness. Um, I mean, it's the sort of thing that, that is routine here in Texas, but, you know, 
uh, uh, Texas is, uh, you know, America's Australia. Um, but you know, we, we uh, but you know, there, there is, I mean, when you hear that, that yes, in order to feed the world by 2050, we need to increase consumption uh, production by 70%, uh, that's assuming that we stick with the diets we've got at the moment. And we've got more than enough data to suggest that if we stick with the diets we've got at the moment, we are going to fry the planet um, in terms of uh, carbon uh, emissions. Uh, so there doesn't seem to be a very good argument. It's not. There's no joined up thinking here between the people who say, yes, we, we, we absolutely must eat like Americans. Uh, and, you know, if, if, talk to a nutritionist. No, I'm, I'm also a professor of nutrition and uh, we, we have uh, here the, the sort of abbreviation of the standard American diet. And it's sad. Uh, and the, the standard American diet is sad. I mean, it's sad for the planet. It's sad uh, in terms of what it does to your body. Uh, and of course, it involves a kind of, again, giving up of pleasure uh, in, in order to sort of substitute pleasure for salt, fat, sugar, and quantity. If we're not going to get it from our politicians, I think this is this is down to the nitty gritty of it now. How are you going to take over the world, Raj? What are you, what are you going to do to make this change? Uh, well, and luckily, uh, neither of us is uh, alone. I mean, you know, y y our politicians and our philanthropists uh, are convening a. Uh, food system summit with the United Nations later on this year. Um, but luckily, they are few and we are many. Um, there was a recent study uh, by Jules Pretty at the uh, University of Essex who observed that there are 8 million farmer groups that are experimenting with agroecological farming. That's 8 million groups of farmers around the world. And some of those groups are very large indeed. Uh, you know, in, in India, the Karnataka State Farmers Association, one of those groups, has 25 million members. Um, there are a lot of people looking to develop these alternatives, uh, and they're not thrilled with what our politicians and philanthropists have on the menu. Um, so, you know, we can't do it alone, but we, we're not alone. We've never been alone. 